Hi, my name is Bobby Collier, and today we're going to do our first teaching of Dominion Bible Study, and we're going to talk about Jesus, the true image of God. And the things that we're going to cover today, first of all, we're going to go over our Dominion Bible Study objectives. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. We're going to see that Jesus is the exact image of our Father, also that God does not change. And we'll talk a little bit about the name of God and see that Jesus told us the name of God and he manifested the name Father to us. We'll also talk about um, what the Bible says, which is we are to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the old covenant, but of the new covenant alone. And then we'll end up each of our Dominion Bible study sessions with some questions, which you can work on in your own time. And these will help you to take to heart the material. Hey, let's take a look at Dominion Bible Study objectives. So first of all, I want to share with you the things that are working well in my life. Over the last several years, I've learned to walk in faith. I've learned about the authority that God has given to believers. And now I am proficient in doing the works of Jesus, such as healing the sick, casting out demons, praying, and actually seeing answers to all of our prayers. Okay, so this is a brand new life. I've learned how to walk in faith. I'm able to walk in victory personally, and I'm also able to help the people around me. And of course, there's still lots of growth that I need to do, but nonetheless, there's a lot that's working really well, and I want to begin to share these things with you. Secondly, we want to come to know the true and good nature of our Father, of Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit. And it's so important because most people, they have... Uh, you know, they have a, a very wrong idea about the character and nature of God, especially our Father. And so we're going to get that cleared away. And we're also going to learn about the goodwill and promises of our Father. And we're going to come to believe in them, and we're going to walk them out, and we're going to have a victorious life. And not only that, when we learn the goodwill and promises of God, we're able to help the people around us. And number four, we want to learn about authority. We want to learn about the Holy Spirit, and we want to learn about the power of God, which comes with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we want to learn to operate in the power of God to help people around us and to walk in personal victory. And number five, we want to take on our identity as sons of God. You know, the Bible says many good things about who we are. Um, it says that we're sons of God. It says that we're kings, we're priests. We're conquerors, we're triumphant ones, we're overcomers. It says many things about us, and we want to take on our identity so that we can begin walking it out. Number six, we want to arise in faith to do the works of Jesus and to do greater works. So in John 14, 12, Jesus said that anyone who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And so we want to do the things that Jesus was doing. And what was he doing? He was preaching and teaching. He was healing the sick. He was raising the dead. He was casting out demons. He was reading the hearts and minds of people around him. He was walking on water, performing miracles, signs and wonders. Okay, so all those things that he was doing, he says that we, the believers, will also do. He said that we will even do greater works than what he did. Okay, so we want to grow in doing those same works, and we also want to grow into the greater works. Amen? And then... As more and more believers begin to walk this way, then we'll be able to transform this world, which is the will of our Father. We'll be able to bring his will into the earth. We'll destroy the works of the enemy, and we'll bring the good will of God to pass on this planet. Amen. Okay, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, 4-6 Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame okay so the bible says that jesus is the chief cornerstone so what exactly is a cornerstone the cornerstone definition the cornerstone is the first stone 
set in the construction of a building. It is important because all other stones will be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. Okay, so this is very important. So what this is saying to us, Jesus is the cornerstone. That means every other stone. Okay, so me and you, it says we are living stones. Okay, so we're being built together with Christ into uh, a spiritual habitation. Okay, so we need to be set in reference to the cornerstone. We need to be set in reference to Jesus. Okay, so we need to be perfectly aligned with Jesus is what this say, is saying. He is the cornerstone. Everything about us must line up with him. Okay, the Bible doesn't say to line up with Jehovah from the Old Testament. It says to line up with Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone, not the Old Testament image of God, not Yahweh, not Jehovah. It is Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. We must align ourselves perfectly with Jesus. And if we're perfectly aligned, then this building will come together the way it should. If we're misaligned, then there's going to be trouble. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are building on the foundation of Jesus. We want to make sure that everything that we build into our belief system perfectly aligns with Jesus, aligns with the things he said, aligns with the way he lived his life. We must align with Jesus. And I'm going to make a big deal out of this today, but the number one reason why people are weak in faith is because they have an Old Testament image of God, which is a wrong image of God. They have built on their foundation things from the Old Covenant when we need to be building upon Jesus. It is extremely important to be successful in faith and to truly know and love our Father and to do the works of Jesus. We must set aside the old and we must lay hold of Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the cornerstone. Everything we build on our belief system must agree with Jesus. Not with the Old Testament. It must agree with Jesus. Amen? Okay, let's just read these points. Number four, Jesus Christ, as revealed in the Gospels, is the foundation of our faith. Every aspect of our belief system must be built upon and aligned with Jesus, not the Old Testament image of God. Okay, we are not trying to align ourselves with you know, the Lord your God or with Yahweh or with Jehovah. Okay, we're going to look at some we're going to look at something in a little while and see that there's some, some problems in the Old Testament. We must align with Jesus. We must build on the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. We must set ourselves in reference to Jesus, the cornerstone. Okay, We must build on our foundation Jesus Christ alone and things which align with him. Amen? Okay, and number five, we're going to see some examples of this in a second. But let's be honest, there are contradictions in the Bible, especially there are contradictions between the New Testament and the Old Testament. And the way we need to deal with contradictions, you know, whether in the Bible or in life, is we need to, we can keep anything that aligns with Jesus, we keep it as truth. Anything that does not align with Jesus, we reject it, we do not add it to our foundation, nor do we add it to our image of God. Okay, this is super important. Jesus revealed the image of God to us. We're going to align with Jesus. We're going to build our faith based on the things Jesus said and did and everything that agrees with him. And we're going to reject everything that disagrees with Jesus. Okay. And the Bible says that we are ministers of the new covenant. We are ministers of the new covenant. We are not ministers of the old covenant. We should not mingle the old and the new covenants we are new covenant we are new creations we are in christ christ is in us we build upon jesus and we just keep it simple like that our faith will be effective amen the bible tells us that jesus is the exact image of our father so we want to build our image of god based upon who jesus revealed him to be so John 1, 17 to 18, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Okay, so this passage is saying that truth came through Jesus. And that means there may have been some untruth before Jesus came. Okay, so we need to hone in on what Jesus says. Whatever he says, that will be truth. And the Bible, interestingly, says in at least five different places in the New Testament that no one has seen God at any time. Okay, well, when you read the Old Testament, you get a different picture than that. So there's some mystery that we need to resolve here. Okay, then it also says that Jesus... He has declared, he has made the Father known to us. Okay, so the Bible says multiple times in the New Testament that no one has ever known the Father. No one has ever known the Father. Jesus made known to us who the Father is. So it's real important if we want to have an accurate perspective of who God really is and what his nature is, we can't base it on the Old Testament. We have to base it on who Jesus revealed him to be. This is super important. Okay? Our image of God must be built upon Jesus. John 5, 36 to 37. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Again, this is another very interesting passage from John. And this makes us call into question things from the Old Testament. And the, most importantly here, Jesus is saying that we can recognize him by the works that he does. Okay, the works that you see through Jesus are life-giving works. Everything that Jesus did was life-giving. He was raising the dead. He was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. He was multiplying the food. He was helping people. He refused to punish people. You know, there's this long list of good things that he did. Okay, and those are the works of the Father. Okay, if you look back in the Old Testament, there's a lot of killing. There's a lot of making sick and putting on curses. Okay, and those are not the works that Jesus was doing. Jesus had different works than what you find in the Old Testament. The works of Jesus bear witness to the Father. The works of Jesus are the works of, of Father, of our Daddy. So our Father is a life giver. Our Father is a healer. Our Father doesn't want us to be possessed with devils and he, and he casts them out. Our Father wants our needs to be met, okay? So we need to look at the works of Jesus, and that is that is an important part of our image of our Father, the life-giving works of Jesus. Okay, you'll also notice it says, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Again, this calls into question a lot of what we saw in the Old Testament, where, for example, Moses would have face-to-face -face conversations with Yahweh, and he saw him, face to face. He heard him in an audible voice. But here, Jesus is saying that no one has ever heard his voice at any time, nor seen him. Okay, so we'll come back to that later on. In John 14, 6-9, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? All right, so Jesus, he is the truth. He is the source of truth. Truth came through Jesus. It tells us in John chapter 1. Jesus himself says it in John chapter 14. He is the truth. He is the way. Okay, he revealed to us the Father. And when we look at Jesus, the way he lived his life, the works that he was doing, and the things that he said, in particular his plain speech, not the parables, but his plain speech, his plain teaching, and his character that he revealed, and the works that he did, that is the exact image of our Father. Amen? Okay, so when we look at Jesus, we have a fully revealed image of who our Father is. And if we look at Hebrews 1.3, it says, Jesus being the brightness of his glory 
and the express image of his person. Okay, so this passage was talking about Jesus is the brightness of our Father's glory, and Jesus is the express image of our Father's person. Okay, meaning he is an exact replica of the Father on the earth. And again in Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So all these passages here, they're telling us that Jesus has exactly and perfectly revealed the Father to us. If we want to know who God really is, we need to look at Jesus. Our Father is a life giver. Our Father is a healer. Our Father is a dead raiser. Our Father is a devil caster outer. Our Father is a provider. Our Father is good and only good. Our Father is not a punisher. Remember, Jesus refused to punish the lady that was caught in adultery. Okay, Our Father is not a retaliator. Remember, on multiple occasions, Jesus, he, was, he blessed the enemy. He prayed for the enemy. He never hurt them. Okay, so when we look at Jesus, we'll see the true picture of our Father. So it's super important if we want to be strong in faith and we really want to know who our Father is, we must look at Jesus and let him be the image of God to us. The Bible tells us and Jesus tells us that that is what we're to do. The Bible also tells us that God does not change. In at least three places, he says so. In Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Okay, so he's saying, I do not change. And therefore they're not consumed. These people are not killed. Because God is not a killer, and he does not change. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so when we look at Jesus as he was revealed in the Gospels, that's the way God was all the way back from the beginning of time in the Old Testament to the day that he was living out the gospel to our present day right now and to the future. God never changes. Jesus never changes. Our Father never changes. They are exactly the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have to rethink everything by the character of God that Jesus revealed in the gospels. That is our image of God. He does not change. And again, in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Okay, so again, um, the Bible says that with God, with our Father, there is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. Okay, so our Daddy, He doesn't vary. He's always the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. Okay, so there's no variation in him. He's good, he's only good, and he's always good. He is a blesser, a healer, a life giver. He's never a killer, a destroyer, a maker sicker, a curser. He's never any of those things. Our daddy, he does not change. He doesn't turn, he doesn't vary. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so with these things in mind, let's think about some things that Jesus never did. Okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to begin to build our image of God. So we need to look at Jesus. First of all, we have many misconceptions about what the character and nature of our Father is, especially from the Old Testament, also from things that we've heard in church or by other people well-meaning but who have misconceptions. Okay, let's look at some things Jesus never did, therefore our Father never did, does, or will do. Okay. Number one, Jesus never killed a single person. Okay, Jesus is the express image of the Father. Jesus is the exact revealed image of our Father. God does not change. Okay, Jesus has never killed anybody. Neither is our Father a killer. Jesus never made a single person sick. Not once. Jesus never destroyed anyone. Jesus never punished anyone. In fact, he refused to punish the lady that was caught in adultery. You know, according to the law, you were supposed to stone her to death. Okay, well, he didn't do that. He, he refused to punish her with the death penalty, which the law from the Old Testament commanded. Okay, Jesus never once put a curse on somebody. He never once afflicted someone with trials and tribulation in life. 
He never harmed anyone in any way whatsoever. He didn't retaliate against anyone. You know, if you think about, um, re remember when they came to arrest him and Peter drew his sword and he cut off Malchus's ear? Okay, Malchus was one of the people that was coming to arrest him. So think about the situation. Jesus is about to be arrested. They're going to take him away to be tortured, to be whipped, to be you know, put stripes on his back, to be crucified, to be mocked, to be publicly shamed, to be murdered. Okay, the person that was coming to arrest him got his ear cut off. And what does Jesus do? He could have just been happy about it. He could have said, you got what you deserved. No, what does he do instead? He blessed the enemy. He healed his ear. Okay, so he restored the ear to this man who was arresting him to kill him and torture him. Amen. So Jesus didn't retaliate. The Old Testament teaches retaliation and vengeance. Okay, the Old Testament image of God is not is not the image of our Father. Jesus revealed the true image of our Father. Jesus did not retaliate. Jesus blessed the enemy. You can also think about after they crucified Jesus. Okay, remember, he's already been tortured, whipped, beaten, scourged, and, and he's freshly nailed to the cross. He's in excruciating pain. He's naked. He's publicly shamed. He's disgraced in every way you can imagine. And what does he do? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus prayed for those who tortured him. Who He prayed for his murderers, for their sin to be forgiven. Can you imagine that? Okay, so this is a completely different image of God than what you find in the Old Testament. We must build our image of God upon Jesus. That is the true image of God. Okay, number five, the works of Jesus represent the works of the Father. Jesus is the express image of the Father. And God does not change. Okay, so Jesus, what was he doing? He was healing. He was raising the dead. He was casting out demons. He was fulfilling the needs of people. He was loving and blessing his enemies. And he was all, always merciful and always forgiving. Okay, and there's many other things we could list here, but this gives you an idea that these are the works of our Father. The things that Jesus was doing, those are the works of the Father. Life-giving works. Not death and destruction, not curses, none of those things. Life-giving works are the works of our Father. Amen. So number six, think about the sharp contrast to the Old Testament. It is exceedingly important to view God as Jesus was. Jesus manifested the name Father. So let's talk about the name of God for a minute. Number one, we need to model ourselves after Jesus. Jesus revealed the name of God to us, Father. He prayed to Father. He instructed us to pray to Father. Jesus told us to honor or hallow the name Father. He told us to baptize in the name Father. Jesus told us not to call anyone on earth Father, but to save that name for our Heavenly Father. He never prayed to Yahweh or Jehovah. He only prayed to Father. So let us follow our role model Jesus and pray, honor, and baptize in the name Father. Now let's read a few passages. So John 17, 5-6. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of this world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Okay, so here Jesus is saying he manifested to us the name of God. Well, what name did he manifest? He manifested the name Father. Again, John 17, 25 to 26. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Again, he's talking to Father, O righteous Father. And he's saying, I have declared your name to them. So what name did he declare? He declared to us the name Father. And then he says that by this name, by the name Father, that we will know the love which God has 
for us. Okay, so when we think of a father, if, if someone has a good father, a father is loving, a father is kind, a father is patient, a father is a teacher, a father is a protector, a father will provide for his kids, a father wants his children to be blessed and have all of their needs met, a father wants his children healthy and happy, a father wants his children to succeed in life, a father only wants good things for his children, okay? And that's because a father has a strong love for his kid. Every father looks at his children and wants them to be blessed and succeed in life. And so Jesus is saying that by this name, by the name Father, that we will know the love of God, okay? We will come to know him by that name. He truly is a father. We truly are his children, and he truly does take care of us. Amen? Matthew 6, 6 to 9. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. In this manner, therefore, pray, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So again, Jesus is telling us about prayer, and he's saying we are to pray to Father. Amen? We're to pray to Father, and we're to honor that name. He says, hallowed be your name. We're to pray to Father, and we're to treat that name as the holy name of God. Okay, Father is the holy name of God. That is a good name. It is a loving name. It is an accurate representation of who God is. Amen? Then Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this name is so important that we're to baptize in the name Father. We baptize in the name Father, uh, in the name of the Son, Jesus, and we baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we baptize in the name Father. And then number six here. Matthew 23, 9, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. So when we take all these passages together, Jesus is repeatedly talking about father. He manifested the name father. He declared the name father. He said that we would know the love of God by the name father. He said that we are to pray to father. He said we are to treat the name father as a holy name. He says that we're to baptize in the name Father. He says we're to reserve the, the name Father for our Father in heaven and not call anyone on earth Father. Okay, so Jesus made a very big deal out of the name of God, and he said the name of God is Father. Jesus never prayed or mentioned Jehovah. Jesus never prayed to or mentioned Yahweh. He didn't pray to the Lord your God. He didn't pray to any of those Old Testament names of God that we're familiar with. He prayed to Father. Okay, Jesus is our example. We follow Jesus. We do not pray to Jehovah. We do not pray to Yahweh. We do not pray to the Lord your God. We pray to Father in the name of Jesus. We baptize in the name Father. We honor the name Father. We don't call anyone on earth Father. God is our Father, and we call him Father. Jesus also called him Abba. Okay, Abba is like saying Daddy. Okay, so personally, when I pray, I, I call him Daddy, because to me, that's very comfortable. It's very affectionate. It's very close. So God is my Father. He's my Abba. He's my daddy. I pray to my daddy. I pray to my father. I pray to my Abba. Okay, we're to do what Jesus told us. Okay, on this page, I want to show you why I'm making a big deal out of building our faith on Jesus and not the Old Testament. This is a super important point. Okay, we are to be ministers of the new covenant. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay, so it's crystal clear. So Paul says in verse 6 that God has made us ministers of the new covenant. Okay, we are new covenant creations. We are not of the old covenant, okay? 
We are not to minister the law. Not at all. We are to minister the new covenant and the new covenant alone. Okay? It's crystal clear. We are ministers of the new covenant. Look what Paul says about the old covenant. He said that the letter, meaning the letter of the law, the letter kills. Okay, but the new covenant is based on the spirit of God. It's based on faith and on the spirit of God. And what does the spirit do? The spirit gives life. When you read the Old Testament, there's death and destruction. There's darkness. It's terrible. Okay, they were living under the law and the law brings forth death. In the same chapter, Paul calls the Old Covenant, he says, the ministry of death written and engraved on stones. Okay, so the Old Covenant, it kills. Okay, but the New Covenant is a covenant with our Father through Jesus, and we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is a life-giving Spirit. Okay, this goes back to the works of Jesus that we talked about. Every work that Jesus did was a life-giving work. He was healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, fulfilling the needs of people. Okay, the Spirit gives life. We are new covenant. We are new creations. We are born of the Spirit. We have the life-giving Spirit of God in us. Okay, so we are to minister the new covenant only. We will not be ministers of the old covenant. We will not be ministers of the law. We will be ministers of the Spirit of God. Amen? Okay, now, Paul goes on in this chapter, and he tells us about some problems in the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 15. Okay, and this is talking about the children of Israel. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. What does a veil do? A veil hides the face. Okay, when someone is wearing a veil, you can't see behind the veil. You can see maybe a little bit of an image of what their face looks like, but you can't see behind the veil. Your, your vision is obscured when there's a veil. Okay? So if you're trying to see someone, you can't see them clearly because there's a veil over their face. Okay? And so Paul is saying that when you read the Old Testament until this day, that means right now, when you and I, when we read the Old Testament, when we read Moses, a veil lies on our heart. And what does that mean? It means we can't see God clearly. Okay, when you read the Old Testament, you cannot see a clear image of God. You see a very dark and confusing image of God. It doesn't look like Jesus. Okay, Jesus was clear. Jesus was very clear. We saw the scriptures. He said he was the revealed image of God. Jesus is the exact representation of our Father. Okay, and the character that Jesus revealed is tremendously different from the image of God you get from reading the Old Testament. Okay, but Paul's explaining that there's a reason for that. When you read the Old Testament, there's a veil over it. You cannot see God clearly, and you can't see the devil clearly. Okay, the devil and God are all mingled together behind this veil, and we have a confused image of God. The reason we're making a, a big deal out of this is because when we read the Old Testament, we do not see a true image of God. We see a veiled image of God, and behind that veil, there's Satan, and behind the veil, there's our Father. And so what we see is a, an image of God that is cruel and wrathful, but then we also see good things. We see that in the Old Testament, even, that God is a healer and a raiser of dead and a blesser of people, but then there's all that mean stuff mingled together with it. Okay, so there is a veil over our heart when we read the Old Testament. We cannot see God nor Satan clearly when we read the Old Testament. A veil obscures our vision. Now I want to show you some clear examples of this. 2 Samuel 24, 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Okay, so when we read this, first of all, when you read the Old Testament, depending what Bible version you use, you'll see the name of, of God in the Old Testament um, in different ways. It can be L-O-R-D, you know, all capital letters, 
like in New King James, or if you look in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh or Jehovah. So depending what Bible version you read, it'll either say Lord, Yahweh, or Jehovah, but all three of these are referring to the same name, the same original language Hebrew word. So this passage says that the Lord, you know, Yahweh or Jehovah, um, was aroused against Israel. And the Lord caused David, King David, caused, them, caused him to sin and go count the people. Okay, so that was a sin of pride. All right, and then what happened? So then the Lord, he punished King David by sending a plague. And the plague, it killed 70,000 people. Okay, so now let's look at the same account was written about 400 years later by a chronicler. In 1 Chronicles 21.1, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. Okay, this is the exact same event that the chronicler is writing about that Samuel wrote about. And you'll notice when Samuel wrote the passage, he called him the Lord. He said the Lord caused King David to sin, and as a result of that sin, the Lord sent a plague which killed 70,000 people. Now when you read First Chronicles 21.1, it says that Satan was the one who tempted King David, caused him to sin, uh, and then 70,000 people of Israel fell. This is an example of this veil. Because typically, when we read and we see Lord, we're thinking God, right? Okay, well, it turns out that really, so-called God is actually the devil. Okay, because we know that the deed that was done here, tempting someone to sin, and then killing people, that's a work of Satan. Amen? And so the, the passage in Chronicles reveals that it truly was Satan, and Satan was operating in the name Lord when he brought this plague upon the people. Okay, so you see, this is confusing. As Paul said, when we read the Old Testament, there is a veil. It blinds us. There is a veil which blinds us. We cannot see God clearly, and we can't see the devil clearly. This is a perfect example of that. Okay, now the next thing I want to draw your attention to in the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus do? He counters some wrong things from the Old Testament, and he tells us the truth. Okay, so what, you're going to see Jesus doing something. He's going to say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And what he's doing is he's going he's to reveal something that supposedly God said in the Old Testament, and then he's going to reject that, and then he's going to tell you the truth. Okay, so Jesus himself did not accept everything from the Old Testament as truth. Remember the scripture said that truth came through Jesus. So we need to listen to Jesus. Jesus himself rejects some things from the Old Testament. In Matthew 5, 33 to 37, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Okay, so in the Old Testament, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or the Lord, said, basically he commanded that oaths should be taken in his name. Okay, but Jesus is saying, um, no, don't take oaths. I say to you, do not swear at all. Jesus says anything more than yes or no, he says it's from the evil one. Well, that's, that's confusing. If you read the Old Testament, it's telling us to take oaths, but Jesus is saying, no, don't do that. That's from the evil one. Again, Paul said there is a veil over the Old Testament. Here's another example in Matthew 5, 38 to 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Okay, now who said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Okay, and it goes on to say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, um, and many other things. Okay, so basically it is a retaliation. If something happens to you, you retaliate in, in the same manner. And that was spoken by Yahweh by Jehovah, by the Lord in the Old Testament. But Jesus is saying, yeah, that's what it says in the Old Testament, but I tell you something different. 
do not resist an evil person. Okay, so Jesus is not accepting everything that was said in the Old Testament. He's rejecting some things. And here's another example. In Matthew 5, 43 to 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, again, in the Old Testament, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, continually gave commands to hate the enemy. Go in, kill them all, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals. You know, it was this intense hatred. And Jesus is saying, no, don't do that. I say to you. Okay, so he's, you know, there was something said in the Old Testament. Jesus is rejecting that and saying, but I say to you, don't do that. Instead, do this. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, there's so much more that can be said on this subject, and maybe we'll come to it later on. But the, the thing I want to bring home today is that we are ministers of the new covenant. We are ministers of the new covenant, not of the old covenant, not of the Old Testament. When we read the Old Testament, there is confusion. There is a veil that remains in the reading of the Old Testament until this day. And we just looked at four examples of how when you look in the Old Testament, there are there are some some problems back there. You know, we saw that in this passage, it was called the Lord. And then it says Satan. And we saw that Jesus rejected three different things that God supposedly said in the Old Testament. Okay, so the moral of the story is we fixate ourselves on Jesus. We build our image of God upon Jesus. Everything that we choose to believe, it must be aligned with Jesus, with, with his revealed character, with the things he said, with his plain speech, with his teachings. Amen? Okay, so that wraps up today's lesson. So now here's some test questions. And if you'll actually write out the answers to the ones that are essay questions, this will really help you with your understanding. Okay, so number one, how are you going to build your image of God and your belief system? A, you're going to build your image of God upon the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah from the Old Testament. B, you're going to build your image of God based upon Jesus and Jesus alone as revealed in the Gospels. C, you're going to build your image of God on the basis of Jesus and the Old Testament uh, names of God, Lord, Yahweh, and Jehovah. Or D, you're going to build your image of God on the basis of Buddha. All right, number two. Make a list of the things you recall Jesus doing in the Gospels. What were the good things he did? Did he ever harm anyone? Did he kill anyone? Did he punish anyone? Did Jesus ever bring trials and tribulations upon people? Did he ever make anyone sick? All right, so just think about your recollection from reading the Gospels. Just make a list, and we'll just see what you think about Jesus and the things he did. Then number three, given that Jesus perfectly revealed the character, the nature, and the works of our Father, what beliefs, if any, do you currently have about Father that don't align with Jesus? Okay, so on the basis of how you answer number two, what things do you think about Father today that disagree with that, if anything? Maybe they perfectly agree. Um, maybe some things do not agree. So we want to kind of capture the things that don't align with Jesus. What are the things I think about my Father that I never saw Jesus do? Okay, then number four. What is the name of God that Jesus revealed to us? Who will you pray to? What name of God will you honor? What name will you baptize in? A, Jehovah, B, Yahweh, C, the Lord your God, D, Father, or E, Abba. Okay, number five. What does it mean that there is a veil over the Old Testament? Describe at least one example. And then number six. What will happen to your faith if you have an Old Testament image of God? Why is it so important to have a New Testament image of God based upon Jesus? Well, that's all for today. So God bless you, and we'll talk to you again soon.